Praise the Lord. Also, we're giving away uh, Dwayne Sheriff's book, Identity Thief. I'm sure he'll mention this and give more explanation, but I tell you, this is awesome. I've read it, and I'm really excited to hear what Dwayne has to say today. So, ha hey, Mike, would you mind giving this away to somebody? Or here comes Matt, whichever. Praise the Lord. For those of you that have not heard Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, what a blessing he's been in my life. He's been in ministry a long time. He pastors a church in Durant, Oklahoma. That's one church, but it has many different locations. I think even some of them are overseas. And uh, they have a location here in Colorado Springs or in the Woodland Park area. And uh, he's on my board of directors. And I tell you, he's just a tremendous brother. And uh, I've been looking forward to this and he, and I may have used some of his stuff. He may say some of the same stuff and I guarantee you, if he says what I'm going to say in the next hour, I'm going to say it again. We're just going to overlap each other and share these things and hopefully it will saturate you with these truths about who you are in Christ. So let's welcome Pastor Dwayne Sheriff as he comes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's give a, a proper shout out to all of those that are watching online and again in our other facilities. So let's welcome them properly. Would you give them a, a round of applause? Thank you, God. I love you guys. Appreciate you being a, being a part. Well, I am blessed beyond measure to be with you and to be a part of this conference Andrew and I have discussed these things over the years, and I've been just so looking forward to this. So let's pray. I'm ready to go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding. I thank you for enlarging our hearts to contain the fullness of all you have in our, in our lives. Again, thank you for this opportunity to share. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, I guess that's no surprise, but I will be there in, in a moment, but I want to lay a good foundation. We have a couple of challenges when we talk about identity in Christ, and one of them is that, that people think they've heard it, and you'll, you'll hear people say to you, or some of you may even hear in your mind, well, I've heard this before. Faith doesn't come by having heard Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So these are things we need to be in relationship with the Lord over and receiving wisdom and understanding in deeper dimensions as the Holy Spirit peels back your true identity. It's like an onion. You, you peel one part of the onion and you're not finished. There's another layer. There's another level. And you have to keep peeling the onion. And so do not allow your brain to tell you, well, I've heard this. I'm familiar with the terms. One of the challenges of church culture is people just get familiar with the terms and they just unplug when you're trying to communicate life to them. I've been to Mexico five times and that doesn't make me a missionary, but thank you for that response. I recognize Spanish. I'm familiar with Spanish. We could have an altar call today and people get filled with the Holy Spirit and I may not understand that tongue or, or that language of the Spirit or whatever's going on over here, but buddy, when I hear Spanish, I recognize it. I'm familiar with that, but I don't have any idea what they're saying. <laughs> I guarantee you there are people within the sound of my voice or even here that you're familiar with certain terms, but I wonder if you understand what the Holy Spirit is trying to impart and communicate to your whole, your whole heart. So I want to encourage you to open up your heart. The other challenge is just the foundations. I need to lay some simple foundations in my first session, and then I'm going to build from there and get into some heavier, weightier matters toward the end. But most of us, I have found over the years, are missing it in the simple things. It's the simple things that we haven't laid a proper foundation in, and so we're struggling in our lives. And so please do not miss the simplicity of what God is trying to communicate in your heart and in your life. Let me do this before I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Why am I really excited about this? Well, there's a number of reasons, even personal reasons. 
But why is Andrew excited about this? Why do we feel like this is so important? And why are we so confident that you have an encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit shows you Jesus and your identity in him, your identification with him? We know that we know that we know that's going to transform your life. See, your identity, dear ones, it's your identity that connects you to your purpose, to your purpose in life. Why do we see a generation that is living without hope and, and no goals and don't know why they're here or, or why they are the way they are and they're just not connected to purpose. And when you're not connected, if connected to purpose, you just lose your passion for life. God created you on purpose for a specific purpose and your identity is directly connected to that. And the devil knows it when you don't know it, so he wants to impose a false identity on you. He wants to create a, a fallen identity or identity confusion. Anything he can do to mess up your identity will affect your purpose in this life. And so we know we connect you to your identity. You're going to fulfill your purpose in this life. You're going to be filled with joy. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be happy. You're going to be fun to be around. You're going to go to a church and people are going to light up when you walk in instead of lighting out when you walk in. It's going to change everything. So your identity connects you to your, to your purpose and that is vital in our walk with God. Number two, your identity connects you with your course of life. Your course of life. Who you are or who you believe you are will affect the quality or kind of life you live. See, God created us to live out of who we are. And that's why the devil wants to confuse you on who you are so he can mess up your entire quality of life. We were created to live out from being. We're called human beings, not human doings. All of our doing has to come out of our being. And once you understand who you are in Christ and how God has created you in a very unique way, then that affects all of your doing. I'm not doing anything in life anymore to become something. I've seen who I am now in Christ and all of my doing comes out of that. See, a cow doesn't moo to become a cow. Dogs don't bark trying to become a, a dog. Cats don't meow trying to become a cat. No, what they do is the overflow of who and what they are. And let me tell you something. If a cow barked, that wouldn't make it a dog. It'd make you a millionaire. <laughs> Sorry, that just came to me. But anyway, it wouldn't change who it is. It would just be confused in its identity. And so God wants you to discover and then have the full recovery in who you are in Christ, your true identity, because it'll affect now the entire course of your life. And then number three, the reason this is important and we believe it's powerful is our, our identity affects our wholeness and personhood. We are born into a fallen world with a fallen identity and we've not understood it and the brokenness that man experiences today I believe is directly connected to a broken identity. All of the inferiority complex I suffered with, all of the many inferiority things that I wrestled with and low self-esteem and again on and on I could go with how messed up my life was, it all came back to not understanding my identity in Jesus and the wholeness that Jesus has brought to my, to my personhood. Again, you are awesome in Christ and in the eyes of God, God's plan is a beautiful plan for you and we're connecting you now to that plan. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5 because this is where everything pretty well began for me and being transformed by this man we call Jesus. In May of 1980, I was in college on a tennis scholarship and really felt like I was headed for a career in tennis and 
I had fallen so far away from God. My life was so broken. I had, in my eyes, failed God so miserably that I had finally just gave up on any attempt to serve Him, any attempt to please Him, and my life was just spiraling out of control. And I practice every day at this, at this uh, apartment complex, and a, a lady named Sue Walcott moved in to that apartment complex, and her apartment was right over the tennis courts. And uh, she would hear me teaching tennis, and hear me and watch me playing tennis. Uh, and God spoke to her and said that she was going to witness to me and that it would be a powerful thing in her life and in my life. And so she was just waiting for the opportunity and sure enough, our paths crossed. And it's too long of a story. I give all the details in that book, Identity Theft. I spent an entire hour on the vision because there's just so much backfill that is important to it, but I don't have the time. It would take an hour to explain how she witnessed to me. There's a story in there of a streaker in the middle of, of, of the situation that God literally used to, to change my life. And so if God can use a naked, crazy person, he can use anybody. <laughs> and I just don't have time to tell all that story. So that, that's in the book. But the bottom line is Sue had the opportunity, God opened the door, for her to witness to me. And I just would not have anything to do with it. I wouldn't hear it. She would try to witness to me and I would just, just push back. And she'd talk about how, how forgiven I am and I'm going on and on with, there's no way God can forgive me. I have failed him mis miserably. I was called at nine years of age and I knew the voice of God and I heard God. And at nine years of age, I packed my bag and was leaving home crying, not even knowing where I was going. Freaked my parents out. I feel bad about it in one way to this day. They weren't serving God. They didn't understand God. I didn't know what had happened to me. Just something big talked to me and I'm called. And I'm, I'm walking out with this little suitcase, crying because I don't want to leave home. My dad's going, what's wrong with you, boy? And I'm going, I don't know, just one word, I don't know. You figure that one out. I'm crying. Where are you going? I don't know. Well, what happened to you? I don't know. That's how real it was, though. That's how powerful it was. I mean, I didn't even have any peanut butter. I would have died in three days. And I wouldn't even be here today. It was terrible. And yet it was that real. And from nine years of age, I sought God by myself without any help. And I mean, in a powerful way, a profound way, but I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed and I tried harder and tried harder and tried harder. I'd go to a church and just ask the preacher, what do I got to do to please God? They'd give me a list of rules. I'd do all those rules and still didn't feel like I was pleasing to the Lord. So they'd give me a new set of rules. It was just terrible. And I just failed so many times. I just flat gave up. I know to this day and knew then God didn't give up on me, but I gave up totally on him. And I can identify with people struggling after the flesh, trying to live this life for God instead of learning how to live this life from God. Wow. Trying to live your whole life for God instead of living your life with God in your new identity with Christ. And so I'm pushing back and Sue is telling me, you don't understand, he's already forgiven you. He forgave you 2,000 years ago at the cross what do you mean he can't forgive you now? He's already forgiven. Well, he can't love me. There's no way he can love me. I failed him so bad. I've, and I went on and went on. I fought for hours. She must have witnessed to me from about 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning. 3 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning. Get your story right. Hallelujah. I'm trying to get you to bail me out. Anyway, from about 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'm just fighting and fighting and saying, it can't be, there's no way God can love me. And I had an open vision of the cross. It just broke me. I just wept before the Lord with uncontrollable tears. And I had an open vision of the cross. And it wasn't the traditional thing you hear about the cross and Jesus on the cross. I saw Jesus on the cross, but I saw me inside of him and I saw the wrath of God come on him for me and for all of my sins 
and I saw him die on the cross and in that death I saw I died and then I saw him buried supernaturally and in that I saw me identified I saw my identification I saw I was hooked up with him and when he was buried I saw me buried I saw him go into the lower parts of the earth and in the book I have to describe it's as if God put his hand over my spiritual eyes I was seeing with the eyes of my heart I was seeing with my inner eyes and I'm seeing me die with him, buried with him, descend with him. But there's this hand that went over my eyes. It's, just, it's, it's as if the Lord said, I could not bear the sufferings that Christ did for me on, on my behalf. And he just put his hand over me and I don't know what happened there. It just went stealth. And then I saw him come out of a grave. I saw the tomb. I saw him come out. I saw him walking out and... I saw me supernaturally on the inside of him, but it was a different me. It was not the same me I saw on the cross that died. It was a different me. And then I saw him ascend into the heavens. And that new me that I saw in him ascended with him. Then he was seated on the throne and I was on the inside of him, a new me, seated on the throne with him. And I heard him speak, we will rule and reign together for eternity. For eternity. You can't imagine the impact that had on me. Now, I want to say something here that is huge. While that vision had a profound impact on me, it simply arrested me to pursue God for understanding what did I just see. I was so on fire for God, I couldn't play tennis anymore. I gave up my, my scholarship, uh, not knowing where I was going, not knowing what I was gonna do, and I didn't even have any peanut butter. But I was ready to, to <laughs> to serve God with everything within me. And I, I began to get in the word. God gave me a supernatural hunger for the word of God. And I kept asking him, what did I just see? What does that mean? I've never heard anything like what I just saw. And that's when the Lord began to teach me my identification with Christ. That's when he began to teach me what the Bible calls the gospel. That's when he began to teach me what many of us have not been taught, the power of of the cross and this is where it started was in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in my pursuit of what did I just see what happened to me what does this mean how does this apply what are you saying to me and this is where I started in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where the Lord took me and then just like with with Andrew whom I'd never met or heard of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 and everything began to come alive. The entire Bible began to come alive. I, for a couple of years, read the Bible for hours and hours and hours every single day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your sakes. One translation says, hey, if I seem a little crazy, it's for Jesus. Hallelujah. I love that. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, that's Jesus, then we're all dead. Jesus isn't dying anymore. He died, and there was something that happened to me that the Bible has affirmed that I saw in a vision that I died. That when he died, we died. We were there. We were all at the cross. We were all in Christ at the cross, just like we were all in Adam in the garden. And I'll explain some of those things as we go on. He says, we're all dead. Not dying. We're dead. And that he, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, because there was a death of something, and because you're not to know any man after the flesh any longer, even though they knew Jesus after the flesh, they didn't know him any longer after the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
He is a new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, take a long, hard look. Behold, be held by it. Behold, all things are become new. And verse 18 says, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and now has given unto us all new creations, a ministry of reconciliation. So that just exploded on the inside of me that after all of these years, I discovered there's more to me than my flesh. And the confusion, I can identify with my brother 110% because of the confusion going to church my whole life. And the Bible would say one thing, and I would sit there and feel and think I was the opposite. I struggled with maybe I'm not saved for so many years because the Bible would talk about you're a new creation and old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I'd look at my body. And I made a commitment in 1965 to Jesus. And my body didn't pass away. My body didn't change. I made a commitment again in 1965 and my stinking thinking didn't change and pass away. I'd sit there, all things are of God. All things are not of God in my flesh. All things are not of God in my carnal, unrenewed mind. And yet, how can I go to church nearly my whole life and no one introduce me to the new me in Christ Jesus? How can I go to church and no one explain to me, you are three parts. You are spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray the God of peace sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next verse says, faithful is he who promised who will also do it. God has begun a good work on the inside of me in my spirit, man. He's working daily on my solical man, and he's given me a, a, a promise of my outer man, my body, being redeemed at the appearing of Jesus and his, and his coming. How can I go to church and no one not explain to me a, I'm three parts, B, I am saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. How can I go to church and no one explain to me the confusion I had that the Bible says by grace I am saved through faith right now, but Romans chapter eight says I'm saved by hope, which is future tense. That didn't make sense. Anybody besides me been confused over the years? Oh, come on. You're a mess because you're confused and don't know it. That's not a good place to be. Just confused. I am saved in my spirit man right now by the blood of Jesus. And it's sealed and it's sanctified and it's holy and it's righteous and it's pure and it's complete and it's whole. I am saved right now by faith in the blood of Jesus. My soul, my mind, will, and emotions is being saved daily by the renewing of my mind and the word of God. And my body is saved, future tense, by the appearing of Jesus and his kingdom. I am saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. Your bodies are not even redeemed. Thank you. It's so good just to be somewhere where I don't feel like it's a, a prize fight trying to preach. Just every now and then a nod to God really feels good. Because your bodies have been purchased, they've been bought, they belong to God, but they've not been redeemed, they've not been changed. He said, wherefore, as the love of God is now constraining us, wherefore henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Watch this. No we him no more what? None of us know Jesus after the flesh. None of us walked the shores of Galilee with him. None of us saw him raise the dead. None of us saw him heal blind eyes. None of us saw him walk on water. We do not know Jesus after the flesh. But how many of you know Jesus? It doesn't get any easier than that question. How many of you know Jesus? <laughs> Man, about 100 people just got saved. That's awesome. So we all know Jesus. But how do we know Jesus 
get this, get this. How do we know Jesus? We know Jesus after the Word and after the Spirit. So he said, no, no man after the flesh. One of the no men we're to no longer know after the flesh is ourselves. Well, how am I supposed to know myself if I don't know myself after the flesh? Because all I've ever known of me until 1980 was after the flesh. And I was on some Improve My Flesh tour for 15 years. And I found out the hard way, you can't improve flesh. You can't fix flesh. Paul says in Romans 7, 18, there's, there's no good thing in me. That is to say, my flesh. Why did he have to say it that way? Because there is a good thing in you and in Paul, in your spirit. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. But there's no good thing in your flesh. Your flesh isn't getting any better. It's decaying. It's fading. Some of you fast right in front of me right now. <laughs> and, and I've had people fight me over that. Look at your high school pictures, saints. You're on a bad path <laughs> after the flesh. I didn't even know what flesh was. How can I go to church and no one tell me what flesh is? I was limited to even thinking flesh was my body, but Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace, for the carnal mind is an enmity against God, it's not subject to God, and neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh can't please God. So your unrenewed carnal mind is part of flesh. And you're not supposed to know yourself after that anymore. You're supposed to know yourself after the Word and after the Spirit. If I'm to know Jesus, not after the flesh, but after the Word and after the Spirit, how am I supposed to know my new self now that I saw in a vision? I'm supposed to know myself after the Word and after the Spirit. So you discover who you are in the Word, and your full recovery to all God intended you to be is by the Holy Spirit. Do you know it takes the Holy Spirit to show you who you are in Jesus? You'll recall in Matthew 16, Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I just love that. I'm the only one that ever brings this up, but it's like, Who do men say that I, the son of man am. It's almost like he gave them the answer and they still missed it. <laughs> Who do men say that I, the son of man am? Uh, well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, for one of the few times in recorded scripture, got it right. <laughs> I, I'm not being mean. He's in heaven. He's, he's okay. <laughs> Thou art the Christ, the son of of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're what the scriptures have been prophesying of for thousands of years. You're the subject of the entire old scriptures. You're, you're the Messiah, the Christ, the Son, the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Watch this. It takes God to reveal to you who Jesus is, so it takes God to reveal to you who you are in Jesus. In Jesus. And again, I had a vision of it, but had I not got in the Word, and had I not yielded to the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. That vision wouldn't have lasted. It wouldn't have sustained me. It was unsustainable. It was a moment in my life. It was an encounter with God. It was God shaking me to my core to draw me unto himself. And once I got in the word of God, I began to discover the guy I saw in Jesus after the rest. That's who he is. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. And so let's look at the New Living Translation here real quick before I, I get into some foundational again things. The New Living Translation of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13. So we have stopped... We have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Can you imagine a company of people in the earth that just decide we're not going to evaluate one another from a human point of view? We're not going to see one another after the flesh any longer. We're not going to glory in our flesh anymore. We're not going to exalt our flesh anymore. We're going to see ourselves after Christ, and we're going to see one another after Christ. That would be a lovely community, wouldn't it? 
At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. A new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And yet again, how many people get saved and have no idea something radical has happened to you? Something has changed on the inside of you that has affected your personhood at its core. Your very spirit part of you is radically changed and now learning to renew your mind, your solical part of your heart to what God did in the spirit part of your heart is what releases this new life into every arena of our lives. So let's talk about identity here real quick and lay this foundation because I'll be referring to your identity over the next few sessions and we need to have understandable verbiage. We need to know what are we talking about when we say identity. This is an identity conference. So what does the word identity mean? In the dictionary, the distinguishing character or personality of a person. The distinguishing character or personality of a person. Individuality. Personhood. We are all wonderfully, mystically, created by a creator God and are unique as an individual. You are different than any human being that has ever been on this planet or is on this planet now. Everything within you screams of your individuality, screams of your uniqueness, and that God has a purpose and he made you on purpose to match an identity your DNA. No one on this planet has your DNA. Think about that. Billions of people and no one has your DNA. You have a fingerprint that screams you are unique. You're an individual and that you're created in a special way for a special purpose on purpose. See, once I, once I discovered my new me in Christ, once I discovered my identity, I finally came to peace and at peace with my individuality and being different. That I can be who God made me to be because he made me the way he made me. I'm not talking about the sinful me. I'm not talking about the old me united to Adam. We'll talk about that. I'm talking about the new me, the original me God intended before the foundations of the world, before sin blitzed and blighted, the image of God and the human race. God made me a certain way, a certain kind of personality, individual for a specific cause, a specific purpose. God's purpose for birds is that they fly. So he designed them with feathers and light bones. They couldn't fly if they weren't designed by God and their divine design matched their divine purpose. Fish were created by God to be an aquatic creature and live underwater. So their design by God is gills and scales and their divine design matches their purpose so, so they can live on purpose like God created them to be. God made you a certain way on purpose. Quit allowing the world to discredit your divine design. Quit allowing the world to define you. I'm more excited about the next session than this session uh, that I'm about to get into it, but the world will try to impose an identity on you Families will try to impose an identity on you. The culture will try to impose an identity on you. And it'll ruin your life. It'll ruin your, your purpose. You have facial recognition that even a stupid phone can recognize. <laughs> Y'all caught that. I'm impressed. How can you make something so simple as a face and billions of them and no two be alike? That's God screaming at you that I made you the way you are. Don't let the world conform you into some image that you won't even recognize 
but be transformed now by the renewing of your mind and let God define you and no one else define you because if you'll let God define you in who you are, you will live life and the abundance that God has provided in this life. Amen? It means a relation. The relation established, now listen, by psychological identifications. We all have psychological identifications that form our identity. I'm going to say it again. We all have identifications in this life. We all identify with, with certain things, good or bad. I'm not trying to make those points. I'm trying to show you that your identity is shaped by your identifications. And so part of the Christian life is teaching people their identification with Christ that will now shape their identity or who they are. So what's an identification? Because identifications are who or what we identify with that affects our identity. Identification means to treat or consider the same. When you're identified with something, you treat it or consider it the same. To make identical or similar, to join or associate with closely, sameness or oneness. Scriptures are full of us being cautious of what we identify with because it'll affect our character. It'll affect our personality. It'll affect our identity. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 in the New Living Translation says, bad company corrupts good character. You have to teach your children this. We love everybody, but we can't hang out with certain characters or they can shape and conform your character. Proverbs chapter 14 or 13 verse 20 says that we need to walk with wise men. The New Living Translation says associate with fools and get into trouble. Do we have any parents in here? That's all. People just had a bunch of kids now. That's amazing. One of the most difficult things as a parent was having to, to get over to my children's psyche that we love drug addicts. We love them. God loves them. But you can't hang out with them. God loves perverts. Don't make me say it. But there's a point where you can't be hanging out identifying with this kind of a crowd and, not, and it not affect your identity, your character, your personality, etc., etc. I'm going to do something quickly here, and I need your cooperation. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask a question, and then I'm going to give the answers. It just works better that way. <laughs> and so I'm going to say something, but I want you to think. Now, that's a novel idea for some Christians. I want you to think... What's the first thought that comes to your mind when I say something? Now, don't say it out loud. Be cool. But process what's the first thought you have. If I say Martin Luther King Jr., there's an identification that pops into your mind instantly that shaped his identity. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights. You cannot separate Martin Luther King Jr. from the civil rights movement. He was so identified with that movement, it shaped his identity. If I say Martin Luther, there's a, there's a word that pops into your mind that you can't separate Martin Luther from Reformation and the Reformation movement. If I say John Knox, you may not have a thought on that. Presbyterian Church would be the answer. Here's one. John and Charles Wesley. There's a, there's a thing that comes into your mind that's an identification, the Methodist church. You can't separate John and Charles Wesley from the Methodist church. There's an identification that shaped their, their identity. Let's try something natural. Ronald Reagan. If I say Ronald Reagan, there's an identification that pops into everyone's mind. Now with him, there's a dominant identification and a secondary identification. The first thought that comes to your mind when I say Ronald Reagan is the GOP, the Republican Party. If you're chronologically challenged, you may have thought actor. (laughs) 
<laughs> young people, just Google it, just Google it. If I say Bill Clinton, I'll let that go. Just let that go. Let that go. Cast that thought down. Cast it down. Cast it down. See how quick identifications? If I say Michael Jordan, there's a word that pops into your mind instantly. An identification that shaped his identity. And that's basketball. You can't separate basketball from the great and mighty and awesome Michael Jordan. Now here's the real test. Watch what happens now though when I say Jesus. Do you know what just happened? A thousand things just happened. First thought many people had immediately that's not incorrect, son of God, others son of David, others Messiah. Others healer, others great teacher. I just proved to you that the church has not properly been discipled in her identification with Jesus because you can't separate Jesus from his church and you can't separate his church from him. And yet, I'm not putting anybody down, but those of you that are watching, thank God by the thousands, I wonder how many people, when I said Jesus, your first thought was identification with Jesus, the church. That Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. And you cannot separate Jesus from his church or his church from him. Yet, most of our assemblies put Jesus way over there and us way over here and the whole service is trying to get Jesus to show up or trying to get Jesus to bless us or trying to get Jesus to heal us or get Jesus to hear us not realizing Jesus has for eternity joined himself to your spirit where you are no longer two, but you are one spirit with the Lord. We don't have to convince Jesus to assemble with us. Wherever two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst of them. We even think out here, he's in the midst of them to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And most of my teaching over the years, there's been pushback because I know we have an identification with Jesus God looks at us and he sees us united to Christ. He doesn't see us as victims any longer. He doesn't see us as failures any longer. He doesn't see us as inadequate. He doesn't see us as just trying to do better and get along and try a little harder. He sees us united to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, hallelujah. And yet many of us do not see ourselves united to Christ. We don't see that we're similar. That his very righteousness is your righteousness. His victory is your victory. Him overcoming. I, I'll admit this, I, it's embarrassing, but <laughs> you, know, you need a real relationship with the Lord. I think he loves us just being honest, even in our ignorance. But I can remember years ago, I would read... John 13, 33, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And I would say out loud, good for you, Jesus. I'm happy for you. But I'm suffering. I literally did not see, did not understand what he was saying. Then don't you understand you have an identification with me? Don't you understand that he had no death of his own. His death was your death. He had no sin of his own. The sin he bore on the cross was yours. His resurrection wasn't even his. It was yours. It was your justification. You have an identification that you cannot be separated from this man now. And understanding your new identity, understanding who you are in Christ is what's going to bring about so much change and so much power in your life. Look down at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that same chapter. In the King James Bible, 
For he hath made him to be sin. For who? Jesus wasn't made sin for Jesus, and Jesus wasn't and didn't die for Jesus, and Jesus wasn't raised for Jesus, and Jesus wasn't seated for Jesus. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now watch this. Jesus was made sin without sinning. I need an amen on this. Amen. Jesus was made sin without sinning. What was that? He identified with our human condition. He, God, entered into humanity, became a man, and identified with our weaknesses, identified with our humanity, identified with our pains, yet had no sin. I need to keep making that clear because there's so much confusion in our culture today, even about Jesus. He was made sin by identifying with me at the cross. With whose sin? My sin. And again, get this, Jesus was made sin without sinning. How did he do that? By identifying with me, and God made him that. How do I become righteous now? Not by doing works of righteousness. Not by trying to do better, not by trying to be holy. I am made righteous by identifying now with him. It was my sin he was made sin with. He had no sin of his own. It's his very righteousness I've been made righteous with. I have no righteousness of my own. And yet you're doing pretty good. It wasn't, it wasn't as good as it could have been. Might have been me on that, but most of you agree with that. But yet you identify with sin quicker than you do with righteousness. Many people still today make confessions of identification. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. See, that's a confused identity. If you still believe you're a sinner saved by grace, that's why it's so easy for you to keep going out and sinning. Because sinners sin. Dogs bark. Cows, believe it or not, almost said meow. They moo. <laughs> Cats, meow. If you still think you're a loser, no wonder you're acting like you're acting. If you think you're a victim, that's a false identity. That's a cultural imposed identity. That's the devil. Because if you're a victim and you, you accept that as your identity, you're gonna blame everybody else for a, a miserable life that you'll never crawl out of barring the grace of God. But see, our new identity is we're not a victim. We, we can't blame anybody else and defend being defeated. We are victors. If you have faith in Jesus, the Bible says you're a world overcomer, 1 John chapter 5. You've overcome the world. Well, if you've overcome the world, don't you think you can overcome poverty? Don't you, don't you think you could overcome prejudice? Amen. I gotta close three short, three identities we all have to deal with that God put me on this journey and uh, I'm so grateful. Real quick, three identities that everybody has to deal with. Number one is short-term identity. All of us have a short-term identity. That's your immediate family. You came from a family and you inherited some genetic identity and in the family unit, many of us inherited psychological identities. If you're white, it's because your parents were white. That was easy. <laughs> if you have a big old nose, you didn't ask for that. That's, that's, that's immediate family identity. We can search your family tree all the way back to the Mayflower and we have pictures of people getting off of it and the one with the big honker is related to you. <laughs> it's just genetic, it's our, it, it's our flesh, it's identity, short-term identity. Psychological identities are developed in the short-term identity. Mine, the biggest one was poverty, defeat, negativity. It was so bad in my family. I love my family and they, 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 they're not to fault. 
They didn't know any better. But I picked up all these psychological identities that after I got married, we would visit my family and Sue would notice I would fall back into that old identity. And she would have to, honey, are you okay? Come back, come back. <laughs> Poverty. You can look at my family tree and basically it's the Charlie Brown tree. It does not look well. And in that family tree with my immediate family, everybody was poor. Poverty was their identity. They were proud of being poor. They weren't like those rich snobs. They embraced poverty. They believed that the sheriff family came from the shallow end of the gene pool and we're just all poor, it's who we are. And I can remember when I got a scholarship to go to college, first one in my family to go to college. As far back as you could go, nobody, most didn't graduate high school. I'm going to college on a tennis scholarship. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have a career and I'm, I'm going to break out of this poverty. You'd think the whole family would cheer. Ar, 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 They did not. They made fun of me. They name called. If I break out of this psychological identity of poverty, I'm going to make the whole family look bad. Amen. Amen. I could go on and tell story after story and everybody has their story if they'll think. And so we have an immediate family. We have to overcome those identities. The second major identity that we all have to deal with, I'll be talking about this, is long-term identity in Adam. In Adam. If you trace your roots back far enough, you're going to come to a drunken sailor and then Adam. Come on now, I'm in a hurry. We all go back to Noah and those three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and, and we all came out of Noah. But if you go back before the flood, first creation, creation after the flood was with Noah, but first creation was Adam. We all came out of Adam. Saints, I can fix all the race issues in a millisecond. We're all of the human race. We all came from the same guy. And we had an identification with that guy, and it was sin. We were all born into sin. It was condemnation. It was judgment. It was losers. And we were born into it. And there was an identity we had with that man. When he fell, we fell. Where he went, we went. And it wasn't a good place. And then the third identity that we want to spend time on that fixes the other two, that eradicates the other two, that overcomes and trumps. Yeah, trumps. <laughs> and even when I mess up, it's so awesome. That's so cool. It trumps. <laughs> It trumps your other identities. See, the only way you can overcome genetic identity is through your new identity in Christ. The only way you can overcome your identity that you were born into from Adam and in Adam is to get out of Adam. See, there's the immediate family that you've got some identity issues. There's the long-term family, the family of man. Then there's the family of God that we've all been born again into. And today I want to tell you, you're either in the family of God or the Adam's family. You remember them guys? <laughs> they thought everybody else was weird. They thought everybody else was so ugly. Do you realize the world we live in because of man's fallen identity, imposed identities, identity confusion? They think it's weird that there's a company of people in the earth that want to live holy lives. They think it's we weird. You're weird if you want to be sexually pure. You're, you're weird if you believe you're a world overcomer and that there is nothing in this world that's going to push me down because God's already lifted me up. Hallelujah. You're weird. Well, if I'm weird, leave me alone. Amen. <laughs> Welcome to good weirdom. Father, in the name of the holy child Jesus, I thank you for the sessions from this point on we're going to build. 
We're going to see lives transformed by Jesus. In his name I pray, amen and amen. <laughs>